guys fired up this morning? Amen. Well, I do want to just start off by saying a huge thank you to both uh, just Land and Elizabeth for sharing for communion and contribution. Didn't they do an incredible job? And uh, it's, it's crazy how everybody, everybody has a story. You with me on that? And uh, I'm so grateful for Elizabeth. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and uh, really helping us to connect to the cross. And, and even uh, being able to relate to you with our own stories and our own background and our own experiences and how that helps us to come back to God. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, G, for the reminder about just the heart to give and how great it is to be uh, full of joy through giving. And it's easy to give one time. It's easy to give twice, two times, three times, four times. But when you've been a Christian for 20 years, 22 years, 25 years, then sometimes things get more challenging as you go and your convictions get tested. Amen. Let's, uh, let's be opening our Bible to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. So great to be together this morning. I hope you guys are excited. If this is your first time, you might be thrown off a little bit by the excitement, but we really are genuinely fired up about our relationship with God and about the kingdom of God. In Matthew 16, in verse 13, the Bible says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What, what, what I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I mean, you ever have something that you're excited about, and you don't want to tell anybody about it? You know, last night, Kel and I went on a date with Will and Valentina. And we accidentally discovered the best pho spot in all of Toronto. And you better believe, I ain't telling a single soul about it. That's our spot. That's our secret. You with me on that? Well, right here we find that Jesus comes to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he's trying to get a sense for, for what people are saying about him. Now, it's not that Jesus was concerned about his reputation or concerned about how many Facebook likes and Instagram likes he got on social media. You know, some of us get so traumatized whenever people don't like our posts. In fact, you, you may not know this, but Instagram actually changed this policy to where you can't see likes because it was demoralizing people that not enough people were liking their posts and they were worried about it affecting them socially and, and even their own self-esteem. I mean, that's how much people are concerned about their reputation. That, that's not what Jesus was doing right here. Jesus was concerned about his impact. I, I wonder what people are saying. I wonder how far the message has gone. I wonder whether or not people have accepted the message. You know, I don't know how many of us got a chance to watch the, uh, the GNN uh, Good News Network video. And uh, it was exciting to see our, our little movie stars, the Charles family, you know, Zanya and Zaria and Rochelle and then Michelle. The whole Charles family was featured on the Good News. And uh, one of the things mentioned in the Good News Network that actually happened is that recently there was a negative article written about us in the Rolling Stones magazine. And it was titled, Not Your Church Next Door. Now, the article was written because there was some uh, allegations made towards several people and even our church as a whole that were absolutely frivolous and, and are definitely not going to go anywhere. But the article was based on that. And get this, the lawsuit came out the same time as the article. Same exact day, December 31st, 2022. So I don't know how the article got wind of the lawsuit, but it was absolutely coordinated 
and a hit piece against our movement. Now, you may read that and go, man, that's terrible that negative things are being said about God's kingdom in a magazine. But hey, negative things are always going to be said about God's people. It was true in the Bible, and it's going to be true today. And I don't know about you, but I was fired up. I was going, wow, we're in the Rolling Stones. It, it may be negative, but hey, I'll take it anyway. At least people are hearing about the message. You with me on that? And absolutely, we are not your church next door. Well, here, as, as Jesus goes, hey, what are people saying about me? They go, well, well some people think that you're John the Baptist. Now, now, John the Baptist was a hard-lined preacher. Now, it's ironic because the name John literally means the gracious one of God, or the Lord is gracious. Sometimes people think grace is not speaking the truth. But John the Baptist was hard-lined because of grace, because of God's mercy. And it was through him preaching the word of God that people were able to receive God's mercy. They go, well, others say you're Elijah. Well, Elijah was the man of miracles. And so when people saw Jesus working all the miracles, they go, well, that's, that's just like Elisha, just like we read about in the Old Testament. And then he goes, well, some people say that you're like Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah, through scholars, scholars refer to Jeremiah as the, the weeping prophet. You go, well, why does, why does Jeremiah get that rap? Well, one, because he wrote Lamentations, probably because Josiah's death. But two, is because he spent his whole life preaching the word of God to God's people, and we have no record that anyone actually repented and listened. He ends up dying in Egypt. And so people go, you know, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, and, and Jesus, you've got like an emotional side. In fact, the shortest scripture in the Bible was John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus, what? Wept. And, and the, the irony is he wept on his way to resurrect Lazarus from, Lazarus from the dead. He wept for Lazarus' death even though he knew he was going to resurrect him. He had an emotional side. He felt what people felt, feel. He connected with people on an emotional level. And I think the truth was that, that Jesus was associated with these guys because there were aspects about Jesus that resembled all three of them. But Jesus was greater than all three combined. And so Jesus goes, well, what about you? What about you, Peter? What about you, James? What about you, John? What do you say? Who do you say I am? And Peter, shock of all shocks, gets the answer correct. Isn't that awesome? You got to give it up for Peter right there. He, he, goes, he goes, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, man, blessed are you, Simon. This could not have come from you alone. <laughs> I mean, this had to be revealed to you by God, because you would never have gotten the answer correct. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The title of our lesson this morning is The Keys of the Kingdom. The Keys of the Kingdom. You know, we, we know that the kingdom of God came at Pentecost in Acts 2, roughly around 29 A.D. And it's incredible, if you've ever done that Bible study, where you look at the Old Testament and all the scriptures, all the predictions of the kingdom of God, and then you see all of those things come together in Acts 2. It's convincing and it's amazing to go, wow, that is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God. We, we know that Peter preached that to enter into the kingdom of God, one would have to not say a prayer one time in your life and be really sincere about it and to make sure you say the right words, you know, the abracadabra Christianity, where Jesus, I'm a sinner, please come into my life and forgive my sins, and the little instruments playing in the background. That, that's, not, that's not what Jesus said. That's not what Peter said. He didn't say make sure your babies get baptized. He said you got to repent and be baptized. And the Bible says that 3,000 accepted the message that day and were baptized and were added to their number. Peter, by preaching the way into the kingdom of God, literally opened up the doors for the king or to the kingdom to the Jews in Acts 2 and then the Gentiles in Acts 10. Or as we like to say in the church, Acts 2 for the Jew and Acts 10 for the Gen. Amen. 
Well, he goes on after this and he says, you know, whoever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, if you want to be a part of God's kingdom in heaven, you, you better find God's kingdom on earth. You, you better find the collection of disciples that have all given their lives to God, repented and been baptized. Otherwise, you, you're going to be loosed on earth. You're not going to be a part of the kingdom of God on earth. And if you're not a part of the kingdom of God on earth, you can forget about being a part of the kingdom of God in heaven. You with me on that? Jesus goes, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, this is where I think a lot of people get confused, specifically the Catholic church. They go, you see, Peter was the first pope, and the church was built on the rock, Peter meaning rock. That's not what Jesus is saying right here. Jesus actually uses two different Greek words for the word rock. He looks at Peter and goes, hey, you are Peter Petros, which means Little rock. And then he points to himself and uses the word Petra and says, on this rock, big rock, the church is going to be built. Amen to that? You see, we are living stones, as Peter puts it later on. We are little rocks being built on the chief cornerstone that is Jesus, the big rock. Amen to that? And then he goes, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You go, what is that part out of it? You ever wonder what that's all about? The gates of Hades. You know, I don't know if you guys watched 300. And they, they, they literally nicknamed that passageway where they stopped the Persian Empire from coming into Sparta. They nicknamed that passageway the gates of hell. Well, that's kind of based on this scripture right here, the gates of Hades. And yet I think there's, again, a, a misconception about what this is. We, we know that... Currently, no one is in hell and no one is in heaven. That's something that's going to happen when people are judged. People will be judged at some point in the future, and they will be cho- or God will choose whether they will go to heaven or to hell. And so where do people go now when they die? Well, we find throughout the scriptures in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, there's a reference towards paradise. Luke chapter 23, verse 43, where Jesus looks at the thief on the cross and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so for those that are righteous, they're given a place, a waiting place, called paradise, which I think is going to be a pretty awesome place as we're waiting for judgment. But but what about the wicked? Where do they go? Well, you can look no further than Luke 16, 23, where Lazarus, the poor beggar leper, went to paradise, and the rich man, where did he go? To Hades. And so Hades is the waiting place for the wicked, before judgment, and we find that it's a place of torment. How much torment? Well, this rich guy wanted uh, Abraham to just stick his finger in some water and give him just one drop of water in his tongue to alleviate the torment that he was going through. And so what's the point Jesus is making right here when he says that the gates of Hades will not overcome the church? He's saying that all of the wicked from all generations past, all who are waiting there in Hades, if they resurrected from the dead and came back and faced off against the church, they would still not overcome God's kingdom on earth. I've got three points for us this morning. Number one, what do you say? What do you say? You know, this is what Jesus asked Peter right here. Hey, what about you? Who do you say I am? For for us this morning. What do you say uh, about Jesus? You know, amazingly, Peter got the answer correct. And if you've never looked at Peter's story, you don't realize how significant and how powerful that moment is. Now, ironically, shortly after this, he makes the mistake of calling uh, Jesus to not go to the cross. And instead of Jesus saying rock, he calls Peter Satan. And so, you know, he still kind of goes back to being Peter shortly after this. You with me on that? He, he, he bears a, some would say that he bears a striking resemblance to some brothers in the church. <clears throat> Zero. And uh, he gets the answer correct, and Jesus must have been, like, shocked by this. <laughs> I mean, his response right after Peter gets the answer correct, he goes, man, this, this just, what? P- Peter, this had to come from, from God. 
This had to come from God. You ever look at a disciple and you go, man, I remember when I studied the Bible with you. Who you are now, like, wow. Wow. Uh, I mean, I look at, I look at guys like Byron. I go, wow. We did confession like seven times. Okay, bro, write that sin list again. We already wrote it. I know, but you need to write it again, bro. Do it differently. Do it like this. Seven times. Oh, my gosh. What he put us through in those Bible studies? I mean, our faith grew when we studied the Bible with Byron. And, and then you look at him today and go, wow, this isn't even the same guy anymore. I look at guys like Rich Chan. Rich was a lost soul. And when I mean lost soul, I mean like literally he was lost. Like he, he made his way to church somehow and found church. But, I mean, his first church service, hopefully it's okay for me to share. He, he walked in and he had like Daisy Duke shorts. <laughs> like, like, bro, my wife doesn't even wear shorts that short, bro. Like, <laughs> and he was all into bodybuilding. And, and look at what God has done with Rich. I mean, he's awesome. He's leading, he's leading our singles professional Bible talk. Amen. But, you know, I think that, like, we think that God is saying to Peter, like, Peter, you must have, like, God must have supernaturally inserted this idea, like, inception into your mind. You know, that's kind of how we read it, right? Well, look over in John chapter 1. I I was no different. When I studied the Bible, I was a mess. I was a mess. Thank God there's no historical recordings or evidence of, my BC days, at least not that I know of. <clears throat> in John 1 verse 40, here we find that, that John the Baptist identifies Jesus, and some of John the Baptist's followers follow Jesus. In fact, Andrew and John himself, John the Apostle, follow Jesus. They convince Jesus to let him stay with them. And then this is the first thing that happens after they spend time with Jesus. Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the what? The Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter the Rock. Can you imagine Andrew standing there in Matthew 16? Peter, Peter answered, I told Peter that answer. I told Peter that you were the Messiah. And he gets the nickname? But you know, originally, Andrew's the one who shared with Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. You know how this went when people first start talking to you about the kingdom of God? Yeah, 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 okay. All right, I'll check it out. I- I've got a church that's amazing. You've got to come check it out. All right, sure, sure, sure. But you're just going based on someone else's word? And so at this point, Peter doesn't really have his own convictions. It's just Andrew's conviction that gets passed on to Peter, Andrew's faith that gets passed on to Peter. But look over in John 6. John 6 and verse 60. Sometimes that's how we are as young Christians. We we get baptized, and we have just enough faith to get there, but it really was a lot of other people's faith that pulled us along. And if you stay there, you're going to fall away. It's your faith has to grow. Your conviction has to grow. In John 16 verse, or John 6 verse 60, Jesus was preaching the word. And the Bible says on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? You ever, you ever notice that some people just want to hear like the easy truth of the Bible? This is a hard teaching. Where's the easy version? Where's the, the way I, I can do it with, that, with having my life and Christianity? It doesn't exist. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to be hard. Don't expect easy Christianity. If it's easy, it ain't Jesus. And if it's Jesus, it ain't going to be easy. Verse 66. From this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve? You know, Peter originally started off just hearing it from someone else. But over time, through study, through being with Jesus, his relationship with Jesus, he came to the conclusion himself. He goes, we have come to believe. I, I didn't believe it before, but now I've come to believe. I believe it now that you are the Holy One of God. You know, this, this fact for Peter that started out simply as a faint belief eventually turned into a deep conviction, a deep truth to Peter. And Jesus goes, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. Well, originally it was. No, 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 no. God worked through Andrew to plant the seed. But then through Jesus, that seed was watered. It, it was, it was uh, uh, fertilized, and eventually it gave birth to Peter having a conviction uh, about exactly who Jesus is. And he goes, I tell you that you are Peter, the rock. What's my point? What you say about Jesus will determine what Jesus says about you. What you, and that, what, I don't mean just like what you say. I'm not just saying like just say the words. Like, oh yeah, I believe in blah, 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 blah. You know, there's a lot of religious people in the world that just say it, but don't actually live it. I'm not talking about abracadabra Christianity. This is more than just a statement Peter's making. This is a belief he had deep in his heart. He lived it out. He proved it through the rest of the Bible that he shared this conviction that Jesus is Lord. You know, sadly, we as a church, we get persecuted quite a bit. And it's always ironic to me how quick persecutors are and even disciples that fall away are to pick apart what we're doing, but have no alternative situation or solution. Oh, this can't be God's church. This, this, is, this person's got sin and that person's done this and this and that. And then they go, well, what are you doing? Well, not that. <laughs> but what are you doing? What, what group are you a part of? And I think this is just what Satan wants. He wants us to buy into uncertainty. And then when there's a little bit of uncertainty in our minds and a little bit of uncertainty in our hearts, we can't do anything as Christians. We're blocked. We can't become great for God. We, 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 we allow Satan's uncertainty to fester in our hearts. And we can't stand up. We can't live for God. And we can't preach for God. I don't know if this is really God's kingdom. I don't know if God really loves me. You ever have that question in your heart? Does God really love me? Well, dude, he sent his son to die for you. What else do you need? But I'm not, I'm not feeling it right now. Like, dude, are you going to let that determine whether or not God loves you, your feelings? Dude, I feel different things every day. I eat Mexican food. That makes me feel way different the next day. <laughs> you can't let your feelings dictate truth. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah 17, 9, it lies to you. You want to listen to your heart? The Bible says it's even beyond cure. There is no vaccine. There is no pill you can take. There's no scripture you can read. Your heart is always going to lie. But you know, when, when we get uncertain as Christians, we get quiet as Christians. We, we don't want to say anything. Let, let me give you an analogy. Imagine if you're like Elizabeth Wayman and through your knowledge of chemistry, you, you were able to develop a syringe filled with the cure for cancer. Or let's just say something more simple. Let's say weight loss. Let's just say you had the answer in a syringe. One injection, you will, you will not struggle with weight issues the rest of your life. I mean, would that sell or would that sell? Would you be fired up about that? Rich wouldn't have a job no more as a personal trainer. People are like, I don't got to go to the gym. I just got to take the syringe. Yeah, I'm down. But let's just say 
that there was a little uncertainty with whether or not it worked, or let's just say there's a little uncertainty that maybe there's some side effects to this. Are you going to be eager to share that with people? That little bit of uncertainty what will stop you from sharing possibly the, the best news that someone could ever hear in their lives. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 or chapter 5. <laughs> Elizabeth almost stole my scripture earlier. That's all right. We still love her. She's sharing awesome for communion. We'll forgive her. 2 Corinthians 6 or 5. That's what I said, right? 5 verse 14. Paul says, for Christ's love compels us because we are what? Convinced. Are you convinced this morning? We are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died and for, for them and was raised again. From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You, you remember when you used to do that? Walked into church, what a bunch of weirdos. Nobody's this happy. Nobody's this loving. These are a bunch of fakers. He says, though we once regarded Christ in this way. You used to think like that with Jesus. Oh, that's just something that the weak people need is a crutch in their lives. But I'm stronger. I don't need religion for me. Well, that's just something that rich ministers use to make money for their own lives. I don't need none of that false Christianity. Remember when you used to think that way of Jesus? He goes, we don't do that no longer. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he is committed to you, to us, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. That's a cool title. I mean, I like the, the name disciple, but like ambassador. <laughs> ambassador Bartholomew. It's just, just like, wow, that rolls off your tongue differently. Isn't it? He's made us ambassadors for Christ. I lost my place. <laughs> he says, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin. He didn't say God made him to take on sin. He goes, God made him who had no sin to be sin. Not take it on, be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Don't, don't tell me that you're certain that you're saved and you're struggling to sing at church. Don't, don't tell me that you're positive that this is the kingdom of God. What is bound on earth is bound in heaven, and you're struggling to make time for the meetings of the body. Don't, don't tell me that you know for a fact God loves you, and yet you can't have quiet times. Don't, don't tell me that, that this, is, this is God's awesome kingdom, and salvation is true. It's, we can be forgiven of all our sins, but we don't share our faith. Are you convinced? Are you convinced this morning? You know, there's a famous scene in Star Wars. Do we have any Star Wars fans here? Yeah. All of the older generation are like, yeah. All of the younger generation are like, Mandalorian. Yeah. Well, there's this, this famous scene in one of the Star Wars. I think it's the greatest Star Wars movie ever, The Return of the Jedi. Yeah. And... Uh, Luke's playing his X-Wing fighter. I promise I'm not that big of a Star Wars nerd, but his X-Wing fighter gets stuck in a swamp. But it's really where he was led by, quote, the force to be trained by Yoda. 
And, of course, he, he meets Yoda there, there in the forest. And, and Yoda starts training Luke how to master the force. And so there's this scene that's, that's really become a, a famous scene, uh, I think, in all, in all history since Star Wars. And it's where Yoda is standing on Luke's feet as he's doing a handstand. And he's, he's literally standing there on Luke's feet. And Luke is upside down, handstand, and he's using the force to move a rock with his mind. Pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, his X-wing fighter jet disappears underwater. And Luke says, we'll never get it out now. Yoda goes, oh, so certain are you. And Luke goes, look, Yoda, moving stones is one thing, but, but this, this, this. And then Yoda cuts him off. And he goes, no, no different. Only in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. I love Yoda. He speaks in paradoxes. Like, what does that mean? And then Luke says, he goes, okay, okay, I'll give it a try. And Yoda goes, no, try not. Do or do not, there is no try. And this is where it gets the most profound. Luke says, I, I can't believe it. And Yoda goes, and that is why you fail. I could ask, where's your belief at? Are you certain this morning? I almost don't look very fired up right now. Are you certain this morning? Are you absolutely certain of what this book says? That this is the truth and this is the kingdom of God. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, he says, we believe and therefore we speak. My, my second point this morning is what do you see? What do you say, but what do you see? What do you see? You know, in John 3, the Bible says you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you've been born of water and spirit. Now, sometimes we get hung up on the later scripture that says you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and spirit. But it actually says you can't even see the kingdom of God. Isn't that true? People walk by and go, oh, it's just another group. Just another church group, just a bunch of people, just one organization versus the next organization. And they fail to realize this is more than just your church next door. You ever have a hard time recognizing something or someone? I remember one time we were traveling, and we were going through Phoenix, uh, the airport. And uh, Kelly and I were waiting there in the terminal to get on our plane. And I looked, and there was this very tall, slender black guy. It was dressed very, like, nice, but nice casual. You with me on that? Like, it's casual, but it's, like, casual for a rich guy. It's not, like, value village casual. It's, like, Neiman Marcus casual. Like, it's, like, high-end stuff. And he was there, and I, I, he had big old sunglasses on. He was wearing a hat, and he was kind of, like, looking like he was trying to, like, stay inconspicuous. And so I was looking at him, like, I, I know this guy from somewhere. But I couldn't place where it was. And so I'm staring at him, like, where do I know this guy from? And then all of a sudden, it hits me. This is Reggie Miller. Longtime basketball player. He played for the Indiana Pacers and then eventually played for the Suns. And then he retired in Phoenix. And he ended up becoming a sports commentator in Phoenix. And I go, this is Reggie Miller. Now, I've, I played basketball my whole life. So I'm fired up. Like, not only did I play basketball my whole life, but I grew up in Hawaii where you don't see famous people. Like, I'm not talking about the nice touristy side where famous people come and hide out. I'm talking about, like, the ghetto side of Hawaii. That's where I grew up. And no famous people come over there because then they get beat up and, and all their stuff gets stolen. <laughs> and so I'm like, wow, I've never seen an NBA basketball player before. And this is, like, way back. And I'm looking at him, and I'm, like, nudging Kelly. I'm like, Kelly, Kelly. And we're sitting right across from him. So I'm, like, making a commotion. like, Kelly. Reggie Miller. She goes, who? I go, Reggie Miller. She goes, what? I go, Reggie Miller. And he notices that I notice who he is. So he, he pulled off his sunglasses, and he gave me a look like, don't you dare. I'm flying commercial right here, and nobody needs to know who I am. And I just, like, just kind of gave him this look like, your secret's safe with me.
we're practically friends. Like, I got you. But you know, that's how people can be with the kingdom. Even disciples. Walk in, church service again. Did you come in like that this morning? <laughs> church service again. Sang this song before again. I don't know what they were trying to do with that. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Turn over to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse 31. Ed and Ed, you guys all abandoned Ed and had that final note. She's standing up here, she's like, oh, no. Jesus. Everybody else fell away at that point. All the other song leaders, they left you by yourself. They abandoned you on the battlefield, sis. Thank God for Jesus. Matthew, Matthew 13, verse 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What? A mustard seed? I mean, that's not very impressive, Jesus. Like, at least use an avocado seed. Like you could accidentally swallow a mustard seed. But ain't nobody accidentally swallowing an avocado seed. Did Krikor swallow an avocado seed? I don't know why you're getting a call out here, bro. It says, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all seeds. Yet when it grows, it, it becomes the largest of garden plants. It becomes a tree. So that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Like usually that's a negative reference. Dude, why, why blast the kingdom? Like in the Bible, yeast is oftentimes referred to as sin. Like it's a, it's a comparison. And yet, once again, Jesus is using these unimpressive words and analogies to describe the kingdom. He goes, you mix it into about 60 pounds of flour. That's a lot of flour. <laughs> that's a lot. I know we're, we're using the metric scale here, but that's still a lot of flour. Until it worked all through the dough. You know, I, I learned something about mustard trees. I was, Curious. And though, check this out, though the seeds are only two millimeters wide, like you could have one sitting right next to you and not know it. You could be just like lost. I don't know why you have it next to you, but. <laughs> the, the mustard tree from that two millimeter wide seed can grow up to 30 feet or 10 meters. I mean, it's considered the largest garden plant. Now, there's trees that are bigger for sure, but that's not a garden plant. That's impressive. But here's what people don't know about mustard trees. A mustard tree not only grows to 30 feet approximately, but believe it or not, it can grow from that 2-millimeter size to its full size of 30 feet in just 80 days. Whoa. I mean, try it out. Go get a mustard tree. Don't do it right now. It's wintertime. It's 80 days. And so not only did the mustard seed grow big, it grew fast. Never, never think that, looking at the little baby seed. You know, I think that sometimes we can see the kingdom as being like that little tiny mustard seed. Not impressive, not special, not powerful, not that, not that great. And we can, we can do what Zechariah calls despise the day of small things. You know, we're just a small church right now, guys. I mean, we, we live in a city. Just Toronto alone is over 7 million people. There's probably about 75 of us in the room. 80 people. We're just a small little dinky group. Just a little mustard seed. Do you despise the day of small things? Do you despise what you're seeing? That can't be the kingdom. It's too small to be the kingdom. 
I mean, we don't get all the notes right in the songs. How could this be the kingdom? <laughs> you know, in 1997, when I was 14 years old, it's actually not a story about me. I just had to throw that in there. <clears throat> A man by the name of Reed Hastings and his friend Mark Randolph got an idea. They had just been fined $40 for turning in a late DVD rental to Blockbuster. They dreamed up an idea for a mail order DVD service where you could order DVDs by mail and they would get sent to you and you could watch those DVDs and then send them back at your own leisure. They decided to call this idea Netflix. They introduced their service in 1999, two years later after they developed it for two years. And it took off very quickly. But because of the expensive shipping rates and due to only having 300,000 subscribers in their first year, they actually took a loss of $57 million. But what did they do? They went to Blockbuster, who was dominant in the market as a video rental store, and they proposed that Blockbuster could buy out their idea, buy out their company, Netflix, for just $50 million. They were literally laughed out of the room. And yet we know that now there's not even one single Blockbuster store <laughs> on earth. Some of us young people are like, Blockbuster? Wait, you actually had to put physical things into something to watch DVDs or DVD movies? What, what's my point? Blockbuster dis despised the day of small things. Do you despise the day of small things here in the church? Maybe, maybe, maybe you despise yourself for being small. We, we despise the, the, the small things in ourselves. I wish I could be more like that person. I wish God could use me to do this. I wish I could become a leader of a Bible talk. I wish I could lead a church one day or be on a mission team one day. I don't think I'll ever be able to get there. You know, one of the brothers I appreciate so much is Nero Kabatuando. <laughs> Nero came to me, he goes, bro, uh, I really want to lead. I, I really want to lead. And I said, hey, bro, we've got to have a hard talk. And I've, I've shared this before. I said, bro, you don't have a lot of the natural God-given leadership talents that a lot of leaders have. That said, I believe God can use anyone. So you have to surrender to the fact that you're going to have to work harder than the next guy in order for you to be able to lead. But you can lead. He goes, bro, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and you know what? He works, he works a, a very grueling job as a, a nurse where he works overnight shifts, and oftentimes he comes straight to campus without going home to sleep, shows up on campus, he preaches the word all day on campus, he's in Bible studies all day on campus, and you would never know through his attitude that he just spent the entire night working as a nurse. You know, Jerry Rice once said today, I will do what others won't, so tomorrow I can do what others cannot. Is that your heart today? Today we will do what others won't. So tomorrow we can do what others can't. You know, I don't know if there's any other groups out there that are like us. I hope so. Here's the thing. I don't care. Today we're going to do what others won't. So tomorrow we can do what others can't. And we hope that other people can come and join us in the battle because they see us doing what others can't. Well, what do you see? What do you see this morning? What do you see when you look at the world? What do you see when you look at each other? What do you see when you look at the church? This is the kingdom of God. My last point is what do you sow? I'll go quick. You know, in Galatians 6, verse 7, the Bible says that a man reaps what he sows. A little later, though, he says, do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. You know, oftentimes we frame that, that phrase, a man reaps what he sows, from a negative point of view. 
And I go, oh, that brother's in sin. He's going to reap what he sows. Well, you called out TK like that? <laughs> Whoa, in public. It's okay, bro. But, you know, the Bible is actually saying that you can, you can sow for the world, for the flesh, or you can sow for God. And a man reaps what he sows. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Sorry, brother. It wasn't me. I didn't call you out. That was Valentina, I think. Wasn't that Valentina? Oh, it was Tommy. Whoa, Tommy. Amen. So the problem is that they're in different regions, Central Region, York Region. Amen. First Peter chapter 4, verse 3. Peter goes, remember, this is Peter, the rock. He says, you, you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Man, you, you went to town in the past. Like, whoa, dude, you already did it, man. You spent enough time doing all that, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. Man, those B.C. days were rough. But then he goes, they are surprised, they meaning all your friends, your family that are still in the world. The world itself is surprised that you did not join them in their reckless, wild living. And they heap abuse on you. You know, this is, this is powerful. But I love the King James Version, the, the New King James or the regular King James. He says that you do not run with them into the same flood of dissipation. He, he describes the worldly lifestyle as a flood of dissipation. The word dissipation comes from the word dissipate. Kind of like <laughs> just Lane was talking about the weather in Montreal. Eventually it dissipates. It may be miserable for a time, but eventually it goes away. That, that's what people in the world invest their lives into. That which dissipates. Because you spend enough time doing all that. You, you've been there. You've done that. You lived a, a, a wild life. Man, some of y'all, man, wild. I know that was me. I, mean, I, work, I used to work hard to sin. Like I did. I, I was like a borderline alcoholic at one point in high school. Sometimes I'd drink before school, after school. A couple times. I had, I, my car was stuck in a ditch one time because I drove drunk. I got stuck in a ditch. And I worked hard to get that thing out. I mean, we're literally trying, we're so drunk that we were trying to lift the car. That's not going to happen. <laughs> then we, we saw the cops coming, and then the cops called a tow truck, and we tried to, the whole time, we were working hard to not show that we were drunk. One time, my dad caught me with a cooler of beer in my trunk. My friend found out that he caught it, or found it, and warned me ahead of time, so I had like a whole half hour to come up with an excuse. You want to know how hard I worked for this excuse? My dad comes, hey, I found a cooler beer in the trunk. What's going on? Dad, I had a friend. He was wasted. And I didn't want him to drive drunk, so I told him to put his beer in my car. I'll drive him so that he gets home safely. I was doing a good deed, Dad. I worked hard for that excuse. We worked so hard to sin. For what? Just dissipation. And then sadly we come into the kingdom of God and we don't sow anything for God. We don't work. I, mean, I work so hard in the world. At least work hard in the kingdom for something that lasts. Go to Titus 2. We'll close out here. Titus 2. <laughs> all, all of our memories are coming back. Oh, man. Thank God for Jesus. I, I love the fact the Bible says that Jesus forgives and then he remembers it no more. So we remember it, but Jesus doesn't remember it. Thank God. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It offers it to all people. Not everybody's going to say yes. 
It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and the worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own willing to do what is good. He says, eager, eager to do what is good. You know, Jesus defines those that are disciples, not as those that are willing to do good, but those that are eager to do good. And isn't that us? We, we want to go and crank for the Lord. We want to go and share with our friends. We want to go and invite people to Bible talk. We want to build a church. We want to plant a church in Ottawa. We want to plant a church in Winnipeg. We want to plant a church in B.C., British Columbia. We want to plant a church in Montreal, Quebec. Who cares if it's an atheistic city? We want to do it. We're eager to do good as disciples. Don't we want to do good for each other? We want to take care of each other. We want to help each other. We want to because that's what God has done for us. Edmund Burke once said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in a world is that good men and that's what Satan wants. He wants you to sit in your hands. And then that's sometimes we, we, as Christians, that's what we, we think we're supposed to do. Don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. But, dude, you're sinning right there. You're not doing anything. Go do something for God. You know, I, I was uh, putting together the, the church banners. That are, our last church banners broke. That's why they're not behind me here. And uh, it was kind of cool because we were designing them, and there was different designs for each future region of the Toronto church. And so it's cool. We designed a, a banner for the Peel region. We designed a banner for the Halton region, for the Durham region, for the Hamilton region of the Toronto church. I mean, it was awesome. And it was so cool because uh, although we won't print them all right now because we only got two regions. We only got the York region and the Central region. Amen? But I was just looking. I go, wow. Man, we get to do this. We get to do this, guys. A city of 7 million lost souls. And God has chosen us, and we get to share this with the world. And we're going to plant the region in Peel. We're going to plant the region in Halton and Durham and Hamilton. And we're going to get all of those millions of lost souls. You with me on that? Why? Because the Bible says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Next week, we have a super Sunday service. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know. Not all of you guys like American football. In fact, some of you guys think football is a ball that you kick around on a, on a field into a goal. Com complete and utter false doctrine. But hey, you know what? Super Bowl Sunday is an excuse to be fired up about God because God is super. And it's a chance for us to invite our friends on a service and to introduce them to a super God. You know, I was inspired by an email I received last night from Kip. He shared with us that there was a, a recently when he went to India, he met the oldest living disciple in the movement. 105 years old. Wow. I don't know what she's eating, but i got to get myself on that diet plan right there. Now get this. Get this. She was traveling a, an hour and a half to church every Sunday. 105 years old. Excitingly, she passed away last night. I say excitingly because she lived it. That's how I want to go. Not, not necessarily at 105. but <laughs> I want to go faithful to God. And so this morning, what do you say? What do you see? And what do you sow? On this rock, Jesus, we will build his church. Jesus will build his church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. To God be all the glory.